Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Jocelyn Kennedy. I'm the executive director of the Harvard Law School Library, and I want to welcome you and thank you all for joining us today. Copies of today's book are on sale outside the room, so stick around after the talk. I think Professor Hayes will stick around for a few minutes and sign a copy if you're interested. I also want to let you know that today's talk is being recorded. It'll appear on the law school's YouTube channel early next week. Um, part of that reminder is also to let you know that any questions that you ask will also be reported, so you are on notice. Um, thanks to the Dean for their generous support of these talks and providing lunch today. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Bruce Hayes. Professor Hayes teaches and writes in the area of legal procedure, conflicts of law, and dispute resolution, among many other things. And he's here today to discuss and share with us his latest book, Nazi Looted Art and the Law, The American Cases. So please join me in welcoming Professor Hayes. So thank you all for coming today. So the, story for this uh, book, I guess, kind of begins in 1998 when a painting is loaned by a museum in the, the Leopold Museum in Austria to the uh, uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, a Leop uh, the Leopold Museum is famous for its Schiele collection, and it, do it loans a bunch of Schiele's to, uh, to MoMA. Uh, <clears throat> when a journalist gets wind, uh, I forget the source now, but a journalist hears that at least one of the paintings on this show, at this show in New York has been, was stolen by the Nazis. And this gets back to the state authorities and, uh, who, who, who sees the painting uh, just as it's about to be shipped back to Austria. Uh, it's later, uh, th that seizure is, is, is uh, struck down by the courts, but then the United States authorities seize the painting. And that leads to 12 years of litigation over this uh, Sheila, the famous portrait of uh, Volley. I guess the case caught my eye at the time. I've always been interested, uh, I suppose, for a variety of, for a variety of reasons of, uh, in uh, Holocaust history. Uh, the case, I guess, combined for me that interest with the interest in civil procedure, which is probably my main, uh, which is probably my main field. So I've been following the uh, the cases for a while. Here's a picture of Leah Bondi, the uh, the original owner from whom uh, the painting was stolen by the Nazis. I think what intrigued me about the case aside from its sort of intrinsic interest, is just the, uh, the procedural intricacies of resolving cases like, uh, like this. The, this one took 10 years, took over 10 years to, uh, to resolve. And most of the cases that, many of the cases I'll be talking about, just mentioning at least today, uh, and that I talk about in the book, take five, 10 plus years uh, to resolve. I've, Cat, I, I've subdivided them into, in the book, I subdivide them into three kinds of, uh, three kinds of cases. The Bondi litigation, I'm sorry, the Volley litigation uh, touched off a series of lawsuits. Uh, some claims against public museums in the United States. Uh, and the, uh, I guess I wanted to have this slide before. Um, the, what the Volley litigation led to was, uh, it was sort of part of this reawakening of interest in the massive scale of theft that had occurred during the Holocaust. Uh, there were, there, uh, art was one big part of the picture. Another part was simply other forms of, other forms of wealth. So there were lawsuits against Swiss banks and German life insurance companies for, uh, uh, essentially stealing the assets of Jewish victims of, uh, of the Holocaust. An especially intriguing part of the theft picture, though, of course, was uh, the massive uh, theft of art that the Nazis had, uh, had committed. Several books came out in the 90s which called attention to this issue that had largely been sort of 
uh, that it's largely been sort of forgotten. The Nazis commit this massive art theft, uh, in part out of just greed, of course, in part to finance the war operation, in part because the Nazi, uh, Nazi leadership fancy themselves art experts. You may remember that Hitler, <coughs> excuse me, Hitler was a, um, uh, a failed art student. And one of the artists in these cases, whose work is at issue in these cases, sort of likes, liked to say, if only, they'd admi- if only my art school had admitted Hitler and uh, you know, made me king- you know, dictator, things would have been very different. Uh, uh, so uh, 600,000 estimated looted paintings, um, the uh, 100,000 still missing. And increasingly, historians talk about this in terms of the destruction of Jewish culture. The, in other words, this was not the, the, the theft of the destruction of, U- of European Jewry included the destruction of their cultural contributions, and their culture, their, their, uh, what they owned and what they, um, uh, and, and what they represented. So as, instead of being viewed as kind of a, an, you know, a sort of side aspect of the Holocaust, the destruction of their cultural patrimony, their cultural heritage, has been thought to be sort of central uh, to, the, um, uh, to the Holocaust. It has led to, uh, so there was a restitution, there was some restitutionary activity immediately after the war. Many pieces uh, remain unreturned. There was a revival of interest in restitution in the late 90s. There have been international conferences. Each state in which participating states, about uh, just under 50 uh, 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 50, um, countries, have agreed to uh, adopt fair and just solutions to the problem of uh, the return of Holocaust-era assets. The, country, the countries in question have, have, uh, have there, there are mixed reviews. Some have been pretty good, many have been very bad about uh, addressing, uh, addressing the issue. In this country, there, unlike other countries, we haven't been able to just sort of establish a restitution commission to handle the problem, okay? Because most art in this country is held in private hands, either in pri- uh, the, the, uh, even museums, most museums are private nonprofits. So we can't just have some commission order them to turn over art that the commission thinks uh, should be returned. They have the right to go to court. And so a lot of these disputes have wound up in, uh, in, in, in courts. Museums have, many museums I should emphasize, have voluntarily turned over and increasingly voluntarily turn over things that turn out to have been, uh, to have been stolen. Okay, for example, our, our, the Harvard Art Museum, to my knowledge, they haven't returned any Holocaust assets, but they have returned uh, art that, was t- that turns out to have been stolen by, uh, by the Soviet regime. Okay, and they, the art museum here is very scrupulous, as is the MFA downtown, as are many museums at this point about actually looking at the provenance of their works and trying to uh, hand over works that they, that, uh, that they believe have been stolen. But inevitably, some cases have, uh, have gone to have gone to uh, have gone to court. The cases that have gone to court involving private museums, uh, private museums. For example, this, the Gross case, uh, a case against the Museum of Modern Art, the, have been dis- <coughs> essentially what's happening is the museum disputes that the art was stolen. Okay, so in this instance, the museum did an investigation, decided that it was, you know, which was basically inconclusive. They decided there was not sufficient evidence to turn, uh, that the art had been stolen by the Nazis to warrant giving the painting back to the owner, to the original owner's um, heirs. So they've, li- so, th- so they've wound up fighting the case uh, in, uh, in court. The Gross case was resolved on statute of limitations grounds. The court found that the heirs should have come forward earlier. And one of the, one of the recurring issues in these cases has been, why did the heirs take so long to come forward? Why are we, ha- why are we hearing these cases sort of 75 years after the fact, or 50 years, uh, 50 years after the fact. Um, 
On the other hand, museums have been heavily criticized. Why are you invoking this procedural technicality, the statute of limitations, um, instead of actually litigating these cases on the merits? Okay. Why in other, so for example, in the, in the Museum of Modern, in the Gross case, why doesn't the Museum of Modern Art prove to the satisfaction of a judge or jury that the, um, that the art has not been stolen? That the art was, that the art, uh, was obtained fair and square, uh, it, uh, if you like. One intriguing feature of the cases, as I emphasize in the book, is that the courts often do look to the merits of the cases, even if that's not the formal basis for the resolution of the case. So in the Gross case, uh, this, so this art was um, owned by George Gross, who was not Jewish. He was a, a well-known um, uh, Dada artist from in, the, in Germany in the 1920s. He was, a, he was a, 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 a very outspoken critic of the Nazis. And so he became artistic, pu artistic enemy, public enemy number one when the Nazis took over. Okay? And so he had, to, he had to leave Germany in a hurry in 1933 and came to the United States. Uh, his art was left in the hands of this guy, Flechtheim, um, and, and somehow it wound up in other people's hands. It's not, Flechtheim died, and it's not really known exactly what, I, exactly what happened. That the, the uncertainty in the record was enough to persuade the museum that it shouldn't do any, that, that it owns the painting fair and square. Um, uh, but the museum takes the position that we we're going to defend on statute of limitations grounds because that's the fastest way of getting rid of this case. Okay? The courts, when they, when they adjudicate the statute of limitations grounds, I think feel bad about the idea of just resolving, again, resolving the case on what seems to be this rather narrow technicality. So they actually look at the merits of the case. And if you look in the, at the opinions in the Gross case, for instance, you'll see the courts go on and on about the, how weak the case is, how the evidence suggests the painting wasn't stolen and so forth, be, before then saying, in any case, we don't need to resolve the merits because the, 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 uh, the case is time, the claim is time barred. Uh, if you go to the MFA downtown, you can see this Kokoschka painting, uh, which was alleged to be stolen by the Nazis as well. Again, the Museum of, Mo the Museum of Fine Arts did an internal investigation and decided that, again, it was the, the, the paper record was simply too murky, but there were many indications that the painting had been properly sold, validly sold during the 1930s, not the product of duress, and so uh, decided to keep the painting and successfully invoke the statute of limitations uh, at, um, uh, and still have the painting. By the way, the slides in this presentation were cre uh, created by three students, Chloe, Isabel, and Maida, so thank you. I wanted to be sure I put that in. I didn't want to put that at the end because I wasn't sure we'd get to it. Um, another statute of limitations ruling for uh, the museums in Detroit and Toledo on statute of limitations grounds. Sheps against Museum of Modern Art painting stole, take it lost by uh, uh, the um, collector Paul Mendelssohn Bartholdi in 1935 under very questionable circumstances. Uh, facts remain very murky. It settled on the, day of, uh, on the day of trial. That trial was supposed to begin, so we still don't know what happened. Uh, another case against the private museum, the Von Sayer case, which is actually still pending. My colleague Kathy Spear is here, and she has a remote uh, connection to this case. She knows the family, the Von Sayers, who are suing to recover this painting that was, uh, that is in the Norton Simon Museum in California. We know for sure that this painting was stolen by the Nazis. We absolutely know because it was personally selected by Hermann Goering uh, for, his, for his collection, okay, and recovered after the war. Uh, but the question is whether the Jewish owners from who it was stolen were themselves valid owners of the painting. The, the museum contends that if you look at the history, the art was stolen by the Soviets and then purchased by the Jewish owners from the, so from the thieving Soviets. 
so that the Jewish owners were not the valid owners after all. So that, that case is still being, uh, is still being litigated. I, I, I may talk a little bit about that. It's been pending for, fifth, for, uh, for 11 years now, and there's no, with no end in sight in federal district court in California. There are a bunch of claims of, uh, against private collectors. Um, the Goodman against Searle case settled in Chicago. Orkin against K Taylor case uh, was resolved in Elizabeth, the, the estate of Elizabeth Taylor uh, prevailed on, or actually she was still alive. Elizabeth Taylor owns this painting again, held under sort of, uh, obtained under, parted with during the war under mysterious circumstances, ill-documented circumstances. Uh, Taylor's lawyers were able to get the case um, thrown out on statute of limitation grounds, uh, which I should say, I guess I'll, I'll mention, um, I should say, prompted a reform of the California statute of limitations, which has itself been uh, the subject of litigation I'll talk about uh, in a couple of minutes. F Fritz Grunbaum was a well-known cabaret performer and comedian and writer in, um, in pre-war uh, Vienna. He was a merciless critic of the Nazis. And, um, you know, he was sort of, I don't know, the John Stewart of his time. Is that a, somebody like that? And uh, so when the Nazis came, in, uh, uh, came into Austria, he was, he was very promptly arrested and uh, killed in a concentration camp. His art collection uh, made it into Switzerland, again, once again, under unknown circumstances. And part of it found its way into private hands. When this painting was put on sale, in the, in, by Sotheby's in 2005, uh, Grunbaum's heirs came forward and said it was stolen. Again, the, the, the courts went through the record very carefully, decided it was simply inconclusive, and so ruled in, the, uh, in, the, in, in, in favor of the um, current uh, possessor on grounds of lashes or latches, as I guess we pronounce it, the sort of equitable doctrine of um, uh, counter, and a sort of equitable counterpart to the statute of limitations. Uh, another case uh, resolved in statute of limitations grounds in, uh, in, in the Fifth Circuit. Weinberg is an interesting local case. Um, this painting once belonged to Max Stern, a a uh, dealer in Germany who was forced to sell his work to part with, basically had his gallery seized. He, uh, um, uh, a Nazi functionary purchased this work a couple of years later and it eventually wound up with his daughter, the Nazi functionary's daughter in Rhode Island. And uh, here again, when she tried to put it on the market, uh, it sort of popped up on the art loss registry, and uh, the uh, Max Stern's estate came forward to uh, claim it. Interestingly, this is the only case so far, uh, at least uh, with one minor exception, the only case to be, to be resolved on the merits in the heir's favor. Okay, this is uh, here the... Uh, the, court the court found that the painting had been stolen, that it wasn't barred, that the claim was not, uh, was not time barred, and so ruled in the heirs' uh, favor. Almost all the litigated cases, with a couple of exceptions, uh, have, if they've gone to final judgment, have gone to judgment against the heirs who are claiming, um, who are claiming the works. And I'm happy to talk about that if we, um, if we have time. Stern also, I should mention, is a good, ins a good illustration of the sort of veil of secrecy around these cases. Stern is, for, so as I told you, he was a, he was a dealer, a young dealer in, um, I want to say Dusseldorf, I might be wrong, I might be wrong about that. Um, gallery seized by the Nazis, he flees, he manages to leave town, never collects a dime from any of the art that was taken by the Nazis. 
settles in Montreal and then later goes back in the 19, late 40s and uh, 1950s, every summer, something like that, goes back to Germany and Europe looking for his lost collection, which did not include any really high profile uh, works. I mean, this one is by a forgotten artist from the uh, German artist from the 1940s in the, in the very academic style that the Nazis actually liked, but uh, not, not the big, mo not these modern art, you know, Picassos and such that uh, get all the attention now. He goes back to Germany, tries to find his collection, looks everywhere. There's no internet to post things on, so what he, he you know, he puts out, he takes out classified ads in the papers and and things of that nature, uh, finds essentially nothing. Collects compens a, a small compensation award from the German government in 1964, and then throws in the towel. He basically goes back to Montreal, starts up another gallery, is a very successful dealer in Montreal, well-known benefactor um, in, uh, in Montreal, but never tells anybody. I don't think he had children. He, he never tells anybody about what had happened to him in Germany. Okay. And he dies in, late 19, in the late 1990s. Wills his, his, all of his art, he and his wife, uh, Iris, uh, leave everything to a few university uh, galleries. And it's only a couple years later that one of the executors of his estate goes through his files and finds this, uh, you know, pile of papers concerning his search for the lost art back in the 50s and 60s. And it came as a complete surprise. And so, this, so this, uh, the estate essentially has you know, undertaken this big search for the lost art. Uh, and when something pops up on the art loss registry, they come forward and, um, and, uh, uh, and, get the, um, uh, and do what they can to get, it, uh, to get it back. And the city in which Dussel, uh, I think it was, anyway, uh, it, it, the city in which uh, Stern's Stern had his collection back in Germany, has, um, has been planning to do some sort of retrospective uh, in his favor, a retrospective about his, uh, his work, um, uh, you know, and his, hist his history. Then there are claims against foreign states, uh, most famously probably the Republic of Austria case, uh, Maria Altman's Woman in Gold case was made into a movie. Uh, this, too, is one of the cases that sort of caught my eye about um, and prompted me to do this project because uh, it, it, it went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court had to, um, had to decide whether the case was, uh, whether the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act uh, applied retroactively uh, so that uh, Altman could, um, could invoke it in order to sue Austria. That, that case was ultimately uh, resolved in arbitration in Austria, as anybody who's seen the movie about this um, uh, uh, knows. That's Maria Altman as a young, as a young woman. Walter Westfeld's case, um, I think, is an especially poignant one for me because it was the first chapter I actually wrote for the book. Um, the story of Walter Westfeld is he, he was he was a dealer in um, in Dusseldorf, uh, um, whose uh, whose gallery was seized by the Nazis. He was imprisoned, sent to Auschwitz, and murdered. Um, He was trying, he was making, so he, he was making plans to emigrate to the United States. His brother had moved to Tennessee, of all places, in the 1920s and settled there. And, and after the Nazis took over, uh, Walter was planning to join his brother there, made plans, but then was arrested before he could, uh, before he could actually leave. Um, no one knows exactly what happened to, uh, well, let's see, yeah, his, his art was sold off, was auctioned off by the Nazis. I guess they didn't actually want any of the art for themselves, so they sold it off to pay for the war effort. But nobody knows where that, most of that art is at this, um, at this point. 
a um, curator at the Museum of Fine Arts in 2005 was looking into the provenance, as galleries, do, as museums do at this point, looking at the provenance of any works in the collection that left Europe during the war. Okay, there's sort of, that, that raises a red flag now for, uh, for, for responsible museums. If it left, if the art left Europe during the war, how did it get out? Okay, so she, this curator was looking at this particular, the provenance of this particular painting in, uh, at the MFA and found that it had once belonged to this unknown man named Ma Walter Westfeld. But she somehow knew, uh, she, she did her research and found that Westfeld had relatives in Tennessee. So contacted these relatives in Tennessee and said, we have this art that we think might, that we can't account for, whose provenance we can't account for. And this is, and, 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 the, and the Westfields, as they're called in Tennessee, one thing led to another, and they, 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 they found out what had happened to Westfeld's art and filed a claim against the Republic of Germany seeking compensation. Here they weren't trying to get art back because the art is gone. No one knows where it is. Uh, they were seeking compensation for the art that had been taken and, uh, n and never, uh, never returned. Uh, but the courts ruled they couldn't, okay, that, the, that the, um, they couldn't collect compensation, that the action was barred by uh, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities um, Act. So they collected, they wound up collecting nothing. Um, the, the museum, for what it's worth, the Museum of Fine Arts did decide this painting was, um, was stolen and so agreed to purchase it from the Westfield, uh, Westfield family. Um, let me see what I'm doing. Another unsuccessful suit against the Swiss Con Confederation resolved in Switzerland's favor on foreign sovereign immunities grounds. Okay, so the main theme of the book is the sort of labyrinthine quality of a lot of these um, of a lot of these cases. Uh, for people who are interested in litigation and civil procedure, uh, the cases are absolutely fascinating. For non, for anybody else, for normal people, the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, they sort of re represent kind of a nightmare, an almost Kafka-esque kind of night legal nightmare where, you know, you just want your art back and next thing you know, 12 years have gone by and the case still hasn't been, uh, and the case still hasn't been uh, resolved. Uh, so, what I do in the book is try to give a kind of juris, what I call a jurisprudential narrative of each of the major, either each of the major cases, trying to sort of show the twists and turns that they've uh, that they've taken, all the different kinds of issues. Uh, that they raise. So there are domestic law questions that come up in these lawsuits. The statute of limitations is an uh, equitable time limits. Uh, the validity of state restitution measures. Federal rest the uh, interpretation of federal ref uh, restitution measures. There are questions of international law. Foreign state immunity, I've mentioned. The preclusive effect of foreign, state, foreign restitution proceedings. Again, law students in the audience will, not, will, under, will appreciate this question of preclusion and race judicata. Uh, the act of state doctrine, staple of international litigation. And the effect of international treaties. There were many, many. Uh, there were treaties signed with each of the Axis state, uh, Axis uh, countries after the war, and the effect of those treaties on people's, on claimants' rights to property that was or was not uh, returned by the monuments men after the, uh, at, at the conclusion of uh, the war, uh, has been a much litigated issue. Conflicts of law, there are choice of law problems. Um, paintings stolen in Germany, 
sold in France, shipped to California. Sold later sold in New York, now in Massachusetts, whose law applies. So that uh, you may not want to know, but the courts have to decide. There are questions of substantive law, uh, particularly, um, uh, yeah, so I'll say uh, there are questions of substantive law. And uh, uh, so, for example, what constitutes theft? The, we know that if the Nazis stole your art that you, or your family's art, that that constitutes theft and you're enti uh, uh, putting aside all of these procedural issues, you're entitled to victory on the merits. Um, if you sold to a private person who was merely taking advantage of your financial distress and your eagerness to leave Germany, in other words, your work, the sale of your work was uh, a sale of a flight asset, as the experts call it. Does that constitute theft? Are you entitled to recover work that was sold be because you were in dire straits and desperate to leave, your, and, and desperate to leave Europe? That is a less clear cut. Okay? And there's a recent case, actually, that came along too late for this book. Um, I have a picture at the end, the, uh, a, a suit against the Metropolitan Museum for a Picasso that was sold under circumstances I just described. Basically, it was sold to some Jewish art dealers in 1938, not to Nazis, uh, but sold at a, 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 what the claimants say was a very low price, reflecting the desperation that they were in to leave Europe. Okay, now this painting is worth a zillion dollars. It's one of the centerpieces of the Metropolitan's modern uh, collection, and the claimants want it. Uh, the claimants want it back. Okay, so the courts have had are, are now confronting the question: uh, How much duress is too much duress? Uh, uh, you know, at what point does it sort of um, merge into uh, theft, entitling you to the pa uh, invalidate the uh, sale? And then, as I say, as I've already uh, suggested, there are just sheer questions of fact, okay? Uh, many, some, some of the art thefts are just clear-cut. Uh, in the Altman case, we know that the, uh, that, that the Altmans uh, were forced to, that the Altman family was forced to surrender their prized collection to the Nazis at the height of the war. Uh, we know that Leah Bondi was forced to sell to a Nazi functionary, or actually just handed over, as I recall, just handed over in exchange for an exit visa. Okay, Th that's theft, uh, and, and we know, uh, and we know that whatever barrier there is to the return of this art is going to be procedural or jurisdictional uh, in nature. The the facts in the other cases are just not, in many of the other cases, are simply not uh, are simply not clear. Uh, we, you know, we just don't know exactly how the art, uh, exactly how the, uh, how the art got here, and all the witnesses have died at this point. Paper records are sometimes available, sometimes not. Uh, so the courts have had to have been confronted with the problem of sort of sifting through very, you know, incomplete records, and deciding, um, you know, I guess essentially whether the, whether the plaintiff's burden of proof has been met or, uh, or can be met. Okay? Um, I thought I would give you a, a sort of I look a little bit more closely at just a couple of the still pending cases. Okay? Many of the cases in the book have been resolved. Some are still pending. The Von Sayer case in California, Again, these, these artworks were, they belonged to a, 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 um, a very well-known uh, Jewish dealer in Amsterdam, uh, Jacques Rotsticker, I think, I'm, I, I'm sure I murdered that name, but uh, Rotsticker, uh, who fled, his art was immediately stolen uh, by the Nazis. Again, I told you, Goering himself chose this, uh, the, for his own for his own collection, and uh, uh, after the war, 
The Netherlands took the position that, uh, be, uh, that, that actually everything that the, um, that the Holt stickers lost to the Nazis had been validly sold. You know, many of you know that the Nazis often papered over their thefts with receipts. So instead of just grabbing your work, they would buy it for some, or pro, uh, you know, buy it. Some, I don't know, oftentimes I don't think the money actually changed hands, but they bought it from you. They gave you a receipt, and now they were the valid owners. Okay, uh, so the, the, the Dutch government took the position after the war that the Hotstickers had sold this work to the, to the enemy, and therefore the art properly belonged to the Dutch uh, state. Okay, uh, the, they were, the, the Dutch government was finally shamed into sort of reversing that position in the mid-2000s. All right, after the journalists got on the story, the Dutch government agreed to return most of the work uh, that was in Dutch museums to the, uh, to the von Sayer family, the descendants of Hotsticker. But as I mentioned, um, this particular work was not part of that collection. By that, by, the Dutch no longer had this. They had uh, uh, a, a Russian member of the Stroganov family had come to the, to come to the Netherlands in the 1960s and said, that Kranach, Kranach painting is, uh, was stolen from my family by the Soviets in the 1930s, and so I'm the rightful owner. And the Dutch government sold it to him, and it eventually wound up in the Norton Simon Museum. So uh, the von Sayers are trying to get it back. They sued in 2007. Uh, it was dismissed on... Um, That, well, <clears throat> the museum decided to uh, fight the case on statute of limitations grounds. We've had this painting publicly, we've been holding this painting in public since 1970. It is now 2007, at least we've had this painting for 37 years and you haven't come forward, uh, so the case is time barred. The von Sayers come back and say, well, actually, there's a special statute of limitations that's been passed by the California legislature in the wake of the Liz Taylor case I mentioned. Uh, the special statute of limitations uh, uh, basically gave, uh, gave claimants six years after actual discovery to, uh, to bring their claim. So our case is timely under this California statute of limitations, special statute of limitations for Nazi looted art cases. The museum then takes the position that that federal California statute is unconstitutional because it's a, it, 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 it amounts to California setting foreign policy uh, and Cal states can't have their own private Holocaust restitution policies. That's a matter for the uh, federal government. So the uh, courts have to, the, the courts agree, strike down the um, California statute of limitations extension, give judgment to the Norton Simon Museum, but then the California legislature fixes the statute of limitations in order to uh, address the objection that it can't have Holocaust specific legislation. They simply extend the statute of limitations for all cases against galleries for any reason, museums or galleries. Uh, the district court um, grants summary judgment, uh, uh, dismisses on other grounds, which are then uh, overturned by the Court of Appeals in 2014. And finally, the district court decides that this case is governed by Dutch law, and under, Dutch, under its construction of Dutch law, the, uh, the sale was, um, uh, the, the case is time barred under Dutch law, and that is currently on appeal, the interpret, this interpretation of, uh, of, um, uh, of Dutch law. If, as the smart money says, the Court of Appeals reverses, then the case will once again go back, and eventually there may one day be a trial on the underlying mer question on the merits, which is, was the art stolen by the Soviets? or, or which, in which case the Jewish owners were not the valid owners, or was the art, as the Jewish uh, family contends, uh, never stolen by the Soviets, in which case, uh, in which case they are the, uh, uh, the rightful owners. 
Um, the Kassirer case involves a, uh, a Pissarro that a woman named Lily Neubauer was fo forced to um, give uh, to a, um, a good Aryan art dealer in 1939. Again, it was a sale in quotation marks where quite everyone, I think, is quite sure she never got any money uh, for, the, um, for the sale. The painting takes a very circuitous route through from, uh, again, I think from Germany to, uh, to the Netherlands, back to Germany. It is smuggled to California in the, in the late 1940s or early 1950s. It is sold, no questions asked, as was the fashion back then. It's sold, no questions asked, uh, to someone who lives in Missouri. So it spends the next 20 years in Missouri is again sold in New York, no questions asked, in 1976 uh, to, um, uh, to this German baron who lives in Switzerland, who marries a woman from Spain and ultimately uh, donates it to a museum named in his uh, honor by the Spanish government. Uh, the, uh, the heirs of, the, of uh, the original owner find out about this only in um, in 2000, they try to have it. They try to get the case. So now the painting is hanging in a uh, a Spanish museum. They try through gi diplomatic channels to get the art back, um, and when that those uh, are unsuccessful, finally sue in 2005. Again, back and forth, three or four appeals, three or four dismissals, three or four appeals. Questions of. Uh, uh, of the nature I've described. And um, finally, the court, uh, the, um, the district court decides in, uh, I think, 2016 that the case is governed by Spanish law, because that's where the painting is, and the plaintiffs lose under Spanish law. The Court of Appeals disagrees and just recently reversed, says, well, we, think, we agree with you that Spanish law applies, but we think you need to take a closer look at Spanish law. Okay, the question is whether the, the museum that has the painting is an accessory after the fact under Spanish uh, adverse possession law. So those of you who have studied adverse possession, uh, how, you know, try it in Spanish. Okay, that's, what, that, that's, where, that's where we are at this point. This uh, battle of experts, if you like, uh, will now take place in the district court on whether Spanish adverse possession law uh, 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 applies or how it applies. The Schapel case in Hungary is, the, I think, the last one I'll talk to and talk about, and then I'll just, it, I hope you have questions. Um, I'll be glad to answer. The, the famous Erzog collection in, uh, the celebrated Jewish collection in Hungary is seized by Adolf Eichmann in 1944. Uh, it's return, some of the work is returned to the family, but then seized again after the war by the Soviet-controlled Hungarian, uh, Hungarian government. The Erzog heirs sue in 19, uh, let's see, um, in 1999, file suit in Budapest. They file suit in Budapest, in the Hungarian courts, to get the art back. The Hungarian court, trial court, intriguingly rules in their favor in the early 2000s. But then it appears that they were sort of told by the higher ups in the judicial hierarchy and the political hierarchy, we're not, this art is too important to the, this, this art is part of the Hungarian national collection. We're not turning it over uh, to anybody. Um, and so in 2008, the, the, the Hungarian courts reverse course and say, you lose to the heirs. At which point the heirs come to the United States courts. Some of the heirs actually live in the United States. Uh, file suit in uh, federal court in, the, in Washington, DC, which then has to decide whether the, the, whether the suit is allowed by Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, whether it's allowed by, whether it's consistent with treaties with Hungary, 
uh, after the war and during the Soviet um, during the Soviet era, and of course has to decide on the preclusive effect of the Hungarian proceedings. After all, this case was litigated in the Hungarian courts, and the plaintiffs lost. Are they allowed to now sue in the American courts, having lost in the Hungarian courts? The plaintiffs say we were denied due process. What, it was a kangaroo proceeding in the Hungarian courts. We weren't really given a fair hearing, so the outcome of those proceedings should, you know, should be disregarded. And that's where things stand. There, it's, um, the case is in discovery, in, in pretrial discovery in the district, uh, in the district court, and um, may go to, uh, may be going to trial some, uh, at some point. And I mentioned the, uh, the Picasso case that was, this was actually filed too late for my book, but um, uh, the district court has just a couple, last week, I think, ruled that um, the sale under duress was valid because the duress wasn't created by the purchaser. It was created by the Nazis, but the purchaser was a private purchaser, and so the heirs cannot, uh, cannot, uh, cannot, um, cannot collect it. Why were the heirs, what are the heirs doing suing in 2016? It has been 20 years since this, uh, since the issue of Nazi looted art came on the scene again. This painting has been hanging in the Metropolitan Museum since, uh, since forever. It's not exactly been hidden anywhere. Why are they allowed to sue so late? One reason is because the fe uh, in 2016, the federal government, in one of the last, uh, last acts uh, of President Obama, created a special federal statute of limitation for Nazi-era art, the, the so-called ho Holocaust Expropriated Art Restitution Act, which extends the statute of limitations six years after actual discovery of the facts supporting a claim. And I guess, I, I, without knowing the specific facts of this case, I guess the, the heirs can credibly claim that they did not have the facts supporting their claim, the evidence supporting their claim, until, uh, until recently. So the, extent, the, the federal extension of the statute of limitations pretty much guarantees that cases like this are going to continue to be brought as, new, as either new information surfaces about the circumstances of a family's loss of the art, or as art whose, current, whose whereabouts is right now unknown surfaces on the market. Okay, uh, people put art up for sale, that uh, sends off a, a, um, a flare on the art loss registry, and heirs will come forward. And so I sort of conclude with the notion that these, these cases are going to be going on for a long time. Um, so I'd, I'd be happy to, I want to stop there and uh, take questions if you have any. Betsy? Sorry, it seemed like an outrageous story. I don't know enough about the issues to know sort of how best to interpret the story in terms of where the fault lies or where the particular outrages are. I mean, I guess as an uneducated listener, I'm thinking is something major wrong with the statute of limitations that shouldn't it, I mean, in lots of these cases, it would seem that there likely wasn't knowledge and about where these things were or reason to go hunt for them and shouldn't, isn't there a major problem there? But another, I'll just do two other quick ones. Another is, is there just not enough sympathy for the victims of the Nazis? I mean, there's sort of a lot of times for the world to get it together. There's some treaty, but yeah, there's just, or treaties, and not enough sympathy. It, Really, even though people purport to have sympathy, and thirdly, would be just, is this just typical of what a mess the law is? That it just makes it enormously difficult for people to actually use it. Right. Very interesting set, so set of questions. A lot of countries are accused of still sweeping this under the rug. Remember, most museums are in public hands throughout the world. Most museum, their private museums are relatively unusual in Europe, for example. Uh, so. 
yes, uh, museums uh, long looked the other way on this issue and sort of held art that they knew or should have known had come to them under very fishy circumstances. Um, the, yeah, as I said, you know, people who look into, people who follow this closely say that the countries have a mixed record. Uh, the Louvre just last year, uh, you know, has, or, uh, yeah, late last year, uh, created a special room for art that they can't, that they know was stolen, but they can't find the families, okay? Uh, the restitution commissions in other countries are accused of dragging their feet, of still being in denial about the, uh, about the scope of the, um, the scope of the problem. On the other hand, and there is another hand, uh, it seemed, my, my impression from this project is that American museums have become pretty good about looking at, uh, about not looking the other way anymore. They certainly look very carefully at art that is given to them at this point, or sold, usually given for tax reasons uh, to them to make sure that the provenance is, uh, is clean. Okay, and they've started the, la the laborious process of looking at the provenance of works that, uh, that are already in their, uh, already in their, uh, already in their, um, already in their collection. Um, the, is the American, does this reflect poorly or, or well on the American legal system? Does, you know, I, part of this is just, as I say, it's just the, Art that is held by private owners uh, in a, almost, inediv almost inevitably goes, to, goes through litigation if they decide to, you know, and the, the sort of slow-moving legal process, American legal process, because they have a constitutional right to insist on it. In some instances, there have been arbitrations. I mentioned the famous Altman case. Uh, the, after the Supreme Court ruled that the case could go forward, the Austrian government agreed to submit the case to arbitration. And the arbitrator, I think they did that thinking they would win. It was an, uh, an Austrian arbitration panel uh, that heard the case. And I think the Austrian government thought, well, if it's an Austrian arbitration panel, of course they're not going to turn over one of our national treasures to, uh, to these claimants. But the arbitration panel, in fact, ruled in Maria Altman's, uh, Altman's favor. They agreed to arbitration because they didn't want to spend years in litigation. Okay, but in these other cases, they simply uh, have not, you know, been, they, the parties have just not been able to come to terms uh, on this. I don't know that that reflects badly on us or just on the parties, you know, the, the defendants in this ca these cases, uh, insisting on spending years in litigation rather than reaching some sort of amicable, uh, uh, essentially offering to purchase the contested, uh, contested work. Okay. The cases that are still pending in California that I've mentioned, um, I, as I understand it, there are no serious settlement negotiations going forward. Uh, the, I spoke to the plaintiff's lawyer in one of the cases, and he said they're not even, they haven't made anything like a serious offer. So it's going to continue uh, for the indefinite future. Other questions? Yep. Oh, I, I think you have to wait for the microphone. Wait for the mic. Yeah. Is litigation a good way to resolve these claims? I'm going to put, I'm going to sort of go with, I want to say one more thing about Betsy's claim, uh, Betsy's argument. I say, no, it, probably not. Okay. Are we in a position to create some sort of, al you know, federally mandated alternative to litigation that would resolve these things more quickly and eliminate some of the technicalities and so forth? Probably. Is it a high priority of Congress? Not. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't seem. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't seem to be. Um, is this an? Imp Let me ask one other question. Is this an important issue given the crises that we face today? And I guess I would. I, I, <laughs> I guess I would say this. When I started this project a couple of years ago, the political landscape looked very different in this country, and little did I imagine. I thought it was primarily a history piece. The Nazis, Nazism, that's something that happened a long time ago. And that too, little did I know sort of what sort of revival, uh, what sort of revival of 
you know, white supremacy and race thinking and authoritarianism and, you know, when people are incre just in today's news, there's something about the Anne Frank uh, Foundation expressing concern that about, you know, the revival of Nazi-like uh, uh, Nazi tendencies in the world, um, in the world stage. So, you know, w one of my emotional reactions to the project has been, you know, I thought, I, I, I didn't think that this would become so topical in that, in that, in that sort of, uh, in that sort of way. Of course, no one's fearing for the, for the world's art collections right now. We're worried about other things, but, um, but yes. Um, so my question is about those uh, cases where the plaintiffs are suing foreign governments and the U.S. courts say, you know, throw those cases out because of the Foreign Sovereign Immunity yeah. Act. Um, do the plaintiffs then try to sue those governments in their own courts, and if so, how? So cases yeah, that? not in not in the courts. I look. So I gave you the example of the Westfields, the Vestfelds, this guy whose art collection was seized by the Nazis, sold off, and has disappeared. They would be entitled to what I imagine can only imagine would be millions of dollars in compensation if their case was you know reached the merits. They lost here on sovereign immunity grounds. What happens if they go to the, to the, to the, to the German courts? I, I don't know. I'm not an expert. Uh, but I can only imagine that they're going to lose in the German courts. Because if the German government starts awarding compensation, serious compensation, to all of the victims of, Holocaust, of the Holocaust, who now come forward and say, things have changed. I want genuine compensation. Not the peanuts that I was paid 50 years ago. But serious compensation, just imagine what the magnitude of that award would look like. That's why claims to recover particular pieces of art, where you, all you're seeking is restitution of this one thing, are treated very differently than damage awards of that kind. Okay. Germany has been only too willing in recent years, as I understand, to return you know, many pieces. Not every, not, it's, it's, the country is still very criticized for not doing more in the way of restitution. But you know, if, you, if you can point to a piece of art that, that you can demonstrate was stolen, they'll turn it over to you. But compensation for everything else, compensation for the things that can't be recovered, very, very different story. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you've been focusing here uh, on the Nazi looted art. Hmm. Um, now, of course, much of what's in collections around the world in museums and art museums and yeah. other museums yeah. Uh, has been acquired under also very dubious circumstances. Um, Peruvian art, uh, I mean, I think half of the uh, American, uh, sor uh, sorry, uh, pre-Columbian art is located in Spain. Um, so these cases are obviously tied into that larger question. And I'm wondering to what extent the hard tactics that you're describing that are being used by galleries to defend their collections is, is in part a, a kind of a concern about the, you know, the, the wider implications uh, for these other yeah. aspects of their collections. Yeah, there seems to be sort of a Holocaust exception to the time limits in the minds of, the, of, of museums. That is to say, uh, I mean, that's not quite fair. As I understand things, um, uh, again, they're much more careful about accepting things now. Than they, than they used to be. But you're quite right. Many things in, almost everything in a museum, if you go to an art museum and you sort of, any sort of ancient work, you have to sort of ask yourself, how did this get here? Who was paid for this? How, and how did, it, how, did it, how did it wind up here? It could be pre-Columbian art. It could be Egyptian art. It could be, um, you know, uh, anything that was produced before, you know, uh, uh, before recent time, before recent times, and you're quite right. If you, so I suppose, if you pressed, if you looked closely enough, you would find theft at the bottom uh, of this. And uh, yeah, yeah, so museums, I think, would naturally be quite concerned about it. I think they feel safe that there are no, that that uh, that the law doesn't re require them to turn over things. Any time limit, you know, applicable time limits would extinguish any. Uh, uh, any sorts of claims like that. I, again, I'm not an expert in art law. I approach this. I hold myself out for a purpose of a project like this as a litigation expert. Okay, uh, one does read that art museums occasionally turn over things that were uh, to the to the original countries uh, that they came uh, uh, that they came from. Uh, whether they should be doing more is, you know, a question for 
a question I would do not hold myself out as an expert at. I agree with you. It is very much sort of, it is very much worth asking. Other rea so questions, we're reactions? One, we're almost at 1 o'clock. Is there any other questions? So if you'd all join me in thanking Professor Thank Hayes for sharing his book.